one I copy all that traffic uh, confirming we have a confirmed response coming anyone that's affirmative you do have a confirmed multi-family church fire response battalion one copies so fire shown from the first Florado exposing the second that's what it looks like that's correct all right, YouTube, this Fleet Friday starting out a little bit different. As you already noticed, you could hear this training dispatch for a confirmed residential structure fire. I'm riding along with Battalion Chief Mike Gilbert today to check out the new Battalion Chief 1 pickup truck. What a better way to get a look at how Battalion Chiefs at South Metro operate than to see it firsthand at a training, and this is exactly how things would go at a real structure fire as well. So, Chief, on this one, you kind of have the luxury of being able to fill this out because we're stationary. What do you do if you're driving to the call right now to kind of keep track? Yeah, so I've got the fortune of obviously knowing who's coming in already on the training. But uh, on a real call, when I'm coming in on a structure fire, I'm looking at the uh, MDT, uh, at the units that are dispatched, and I'm really having to pay attention to the radio traffic initially um, to really track the accountability of the first two rigs and subsequent arriving uh apparatus until i'm there tower 45 i'm going to need you to assist engine 23 with that uh hose deployment we're going to be pulling a horizontal span pipe and then an additional we're going to disconnect one of the pre-connect for a second line battalion one command go ahead hey command battalion one i'm on scene i understand you've got a uh, first floor flyer that, that's auto extended to a uh, 4-2 you got a report of a victim trapped on floor two. Your engine, your medic, our fire attack floor one. You've got tower 45 with a second hose line on floor two on fire attack. You've got uh, engine 33 on deck. You've got uh, engine 15 and your engineer working on getting a positive uh, water supply. Medic 33 is uh, not assigned yet. If that's all correct, I'm gonna take it from here. What are your needs? That is correct, Chief, and I was getting ready to assign Engine 33 to assist Tower 45 with that fire attack and search on that second floor. Okay, break. I'll take command from here. Break Engine 33 from command. That's a 33. Did you go to 42, work with Tower 45 and locating that uh, trap victim? Dispatch from Battalion 1. I'm on scene, I've assumed uh, Plaza Command, still working the offensive strategy. We've got a report of one party trapped on floor two, working on trying to find that victim. I understand uh, engine 23 called a second alarm prior to my arrival. Uh, that's where we're going from now. Um, I'm in command offensive. Urgent, urgent, urgent command. Tower 45 Delta, urgent. All units clear the air for urgent traffic. Tower 45, go ahead with your urgent. Tower 45 has one victim, second floor, alpha side. We will be bringing the victim out of the exterior staircase. We need a medic to that location for when we come out. Okay, Tower 45, command copies. You've located a civilian victim on floor two. You're going to bring them to the external uh, stairwell on floor two. Medic 33 from command, I need you to uh, assist Tower 45 and take that patient from them, please. Okay, copy. Fire's under control. You have a primary on floor two. Let's go ahead and uh, open up the ceiling, make sure we're going to have any extension up into the attic there. Command Tower 45. Go ahead, Tower 45. Negative on extension. 
Ready for ventilation. Copy. Negative on extension. Ready for ventilation. I've got the engine one working on that. You'll get it in a minute here. Now that we have the Dave Clarks being a brand new rig, this is the first time I've run commands in my brand new rig. Um, I'm going to try that. Um, I find that with my hearing, using the hand mic works better for me. Okay. Historically, but I'm going to give the Dave Clarks a, a shot and see how that works out for me. Sure. Because it can get pretty chaotic on scene, obviously, with people sitting at my window, at the other window, talking, and I think the Dave Clarks might you know, eliminate some of that exterior noise for me. So I'm going to give that a shot for sure. Yeah. And we'll probably, we'll take a look at it in closer detail later, but just the three seating positions in here, if this was a real deal, this was a second alarm, who would be sitting in my seat? I would either have district chief Mueller with me or the district chief of the day, um, or another battalion chief, most likely. Um, and then I would have either district or a forward battalion chief in the area of most concern and, um, most likely give them a division. And then the back seat is also open. The back seat is also open. Um, historically, I've had um, safety officer, I've had med one um, will show up on scene. If I'm not having them doing a medical assignment, I've used them also to track accountability. I've used them on hazmat calls, that sort of thing to help with accountability. Um, and I've also had dispatchers, uh, IDT dispatchers in the back helping out also. So this is basically like a working office space for the incident. This is absolutely my office space for the incident. It uh, keep the windows up. It's a isolated area. It's quiet. It allows me to really concentrate on the scene and manage the scene and manage the accountability, which is the most important thing. Dispatch, Plaza Command. Did the RP report with department? Uh, from dispatch, we've had multiple calls uh, from the floor below. Command from Battalion 1. Battalion 1, go ahead. I understand you've got a uh, working fire on floor 7. You're in the process of getting a uh, hose line up to the 7th floor using the uh, standpipe system. Uh, your engine is establishing a uh, positive water supply. You've got Tower 45's crew assisting with you and Med 33. Is that all correct? If so, I'll take it from here. Engine 15 for command. 15 Bravo for the command. You have a positive water supply. Yeah, let me know when I get some second alarm resources uh, on scene. I need them uh, to meet my location. Okay, I copy that. You're going to get engine one, engine two, and tower one. Command, division seven. Division seven, go ahead. Confirming you need two additional suppression units. That's a firm, Steve, and also if we can make sure that we have a uh, medical transport unit that's going to be available for us. Your uh, suppression unit's uh, ready. You're going to get engine two and tower one. Division seven. Tower 45. Okay, tower 45. I copy primary complete in the fire unit. All right, Chief, thanks for letting me uh, hang out with you at training to see how everything works inside the truck from the incident command perspective. Um, now I'm sure everybody at YouTube would love to see the light package on this thing and have how you have all of your equipment set up. So let's take a look. Sounds great. All right. All right, so the first thing I noticed, Chief, as we look down here, there is a whole lot more going on than the standard F-150 has. Can you kind of walk me through uh, the buttons and the radios and what all that means and what all it does? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a uh, big upgrade um, from what we used to have in the old Battalion 1 vehicle. Um, this is the latest and greatest uh, for lights and sirens. Um, the, I've already noticed uh, running at night that 
the visibility and um, how uh, bright I am is, is increased tremendously compared to the old Battalion 1 vehicle. Um, so we've got a bunch of different lights here. Uh, obviously the light bar, we've got a three-phase switch here um, that can operate um, front lights. Um, go to a second and you get the back and going to the third phase operates all the emergency lighting on the vehicle. Um, and on top of that, obviously, we've got a lot of different buttons here. Um, we have different sirens, of course, which is the same as, as previous uh, Battalion 1 vehicle. But uh, we've got in, an upgrade in our alley lights, both left side. So if I hit the left alley light, obviously, I, I can light up the scene on the left side of the uh, rig and likewise on the right side, which is a big upgrade for us because the old one, I, I really didn't have much alley lights. Uh, it's really helpful at night when I'm looking for addresses, something like that. Um, so it's a great upgrade for us. Um, the radios, I have uh, two uh, mobile 800 radios here, um, and I'm not sure if the camera can pick it up or not, but uh, the way I do it at least um, for me is uh, I have my main radio um, set for South Metro's dispatch. Uh, I get, I scan, so I get both the uh, channel one, which is the, the channel that we dispatch on, and then um, when I go uh, responding on channel two, I also have that uh, on so I can uh, not miss a call, uh, South Metro obviously. And then my upper radio, uh, I always put on um, whatever uh, law enforcement agency I happen to be, if I'm in battalion one, I keep it on DCSO. Um, if I run to Jefferson County, I switch over to Jefferson County. Um, I found over the years by scanning law enforcement's channel, I, oftentimes I get a lot of information um, from their dispatch center that may not have made it to our dispatch center. And when I'm en route, it helps uh, in making um, tactical decisions. So that's why I run those. Um, and on this, the lower radios are our VHF radios. Um, previous Battalion 1 rig, we had one mobile uh, VHF and we had a portable that was also mounted in the cab here. Uh, upgrade for us now, we have um, two mobile VHF radios. Um, super helpful, obviously, when we're working with the Forest Service, when I go up Waterton Canyon and we're working at mutual aid with West Metro ourselves, Forest Service, West Douglas. Uh, it just gives us capabilities. Um, the 800, we lose um, communications um, about a mile up Waterton Canyon, uh, but with the VHF radio, uh, it enables us to have solid comms um, when working up in the canyon and in other areas of our district too. Uh, West Douglas, if we pop a wildland fire for working with Forest Service and we get in uh, areas there where we have poor communication and coverage with the 800s, we can use a VHF there also. Um, I will highlight one thing on the uh, light bar here that I didn't hit is the, uh, the beacon switch. Um, that illuminates a green light on the roof of uh, the rig here. Um, when I activate that, that's an indicator for um, units operating on scene, other fire departments, police, etc., that this is the vehicle that is in command. Yeah, so one of the new features on the um, sirens with the new Battalion 1 vehicle is a feature that's voice message. Uh, I hadn't ever heard of this, and Matt West, who did a great job putting this uh, rig together for us, um, was explaining to me that they're pre-programmed voice messages. I believe there's seven of them, and it talks about evacuating um, for a fire, it talks about tornado warnings, it talks about weather warnings, that sort of thing. So um, it's a pre-programmed message that if I hit a button, will continue play on a loop over and over again, and it's quite loud, and I can demonstrate that if you'd like. Yeah, let's do it. All right, here we go. Fire warning. Evacuate the area immediately. Fire warning. Evacuate the area immediately. Enter. So this area I need to scroll all the way through in order to get it shut off, and it goes through the seven different uh, messages. Here we go. Yeah, it's a, it's a real interesting feature. Uh, I don't know if I'll use it, but it, it gives me options if I pull up on a scene and I don't have uh, apparatus with me right now and we're, we're in a situation where we need to evacuate, I can put that message on and, and uh, maybe make a difference. Green and red highlighted buttons, what do those do? So these are the push to talk buttons for the uh, Dave Clark headset system that we now have in the rig. Um, in this particular rig here, I have three headsets. One for uh, the front seat here, one for the passenger obviously, and then one for the rear seat. Um, so there's push to talk there. That's how I operate the Dave Clarks. And there's also push to talk on the actual control box here that's mounted behind uh, the driver and passenger seat. And I can show just for the viewers from the passenger side, 
if I wanted my own headset to talk on one of the radio channels, I've got a box right down here by my knee and I could turn on a headset for me. And then there's also a headset in the rear position and a David Clark box right there in the back. So in theory, you'd have three different people, three different headsets. That's correct. Talking on the radio. That's correct. And then what else do you keep in here? So obviously we have uh, gloves for medical um, calls when we go on those. Um, this is a, a, a holder for our Knox box keys. Um, obviously our, our keys we can use to get into the Knox box in uh, commercial buildings in our district. So we keep them in here. If I go on a fire alarm or someone needs keys, I can uh, access the Knox box keys there. Um, I also keep my command board back here. We uh, mount it with a uh, couple pieces of Velcro so it stays um, mounted right there and in place when I'm driving around. Um, it, it gets it out of the way for us rather than having it in the front seat. And if I get on scene, I'm in command and need to pull out my command board, I can use that. Obviously dry erase pins here uh, for that. Underneath the uh, command board is the actual um, a compartment that flips up and we keep all of our wildland uh, pre-plans in there that uh, we have for uh, throughout the district and then other paperwork we may need for wildland deployments, that sort of thing, and other various maps. We've got several maps in there. Uh, the department's done a really good job of mapping areas in our district that have a high likelihood of a wildland urban interface fire. Um, when we get those type of fires, we pull out our pre-plans, obviously, just like when we go into commercial structures, we've got a pre-plan for the wildland area. And you'll notice on here, this is for the east stations and west stations. Um, you open it up, the West Stations are 36, 39s, 40s, and 19s, and it includes a backcountry and Cherokee Ranch. Um, what it is is a bunch of different maps that they've put together, and they've done a wonderful job on them. And they grid them out, and they isolate uh, areas where there's uh, hydrants for fill sites, for tenders, and it'll grid it out and show us the total number of structures in a certain area. Coming in as an incident commander, if I've got a fire that's threatening structures, it gives me a good idea and I can pass that along to law enforcement of how many structures potentially may be threatened in a certain area. One thing that people are probably going to notice is that right behind you there's a big black box and there's not a seat. So what is in the space behind you? So absolutely, that is, um, that is actually where I store my bunker gear and that is, uh, if you recall, uh, former uh, battalion chief and operations chief, Chief Jackson, we had a real big push and we continue to have a big push here at South Metro um, of being real proactive on the can cancer initiative. Um, one of Chief Jackson's big pushes was to have a clean cab concept in all of our single resource vehicles. And essentially what that does is um, it isolates my bunker gear in the back behind me in a box. So if there's any um, carcinogens, uh, any sort of um, particles coming off of my bunker gear, it isolates it to that compartment and it doesn't get into the cab of the rest of the vehicle. All right, here we've got the, uh, the gear compartment. This is the uh, clean co uh, cab concept that I was telling you guys about earlier. Um, it isolates my gear to this one area and it doesn't allow any of the particulates uh, potential carcinogens to get into any of the rest of the cab area. Um, being a gear area, obviously my bunker gear, um, my traffic vest, um, and in here uh, we also have our ballistic vest and our tactical uh, helmet here that we use um, on any sort of um, potential uh, standby blue calls. Um, we also keep uh, the cyano kit here in a pelican case. The cyano kit is something we would use um, in the event that we had a citizen or a firefighter that was overcome by smoke in a fire and I would pass this off to whatever uh, medic was on scene acting as the medical transport and they would administer the cyano kit to any, anyone that had potential smoke inhalation. All right, coming over to the uh, first outside compartment, this is a switch up from our old vehicle. We've actually swapped the compartments of what equipment was where. Um, we now keep all of our uh, medical gear here. So I've got uh, uh, our AED, obviously, our orange medical kit that we carry, and our oxygen uh, kit. Um, and then we have various other wipes, um, hand sanitizer. Uh, we still keep a little bit of uh, some uh, masks um, in case we go with someone that's cov COVID positive or has some sort of uh, a contagious disease. Um, I have a PFD in here for any of our dive calls, any water-related calls also, and then we keep a lockout kit in here. While we're on the medical thing, I think um, a lot of folks who follow us on PulsePoint, and on, um, yeah, especially on PulsePoint, listen to us on the scanner, may hear a battalion chief responding to a core zero. 
for a, a cardiac arrest call. So what is your role as a battalion chief on a call like that? Oftentimes when we go on cardiac arrest, those can be a, a bit of a, a, not a chaotic scene, it, it's organized chaos. It, it can be um, a scene where there's a lot of high emotions. Uh, the battalion chief's role is um, to help deal with the family and family members that are going through a, a really bad time. Um, and what that does is it allows the company officer to stay with their crew and really be involved in the call and make sure that we uh, give the patient the best possible outcome that we can. All right, we'll come back to the, uh, the back side here, the slide outs. Um, one difference on this rig from our old Battalion 1 rig is this has a shorter bed. This has got the five and a half foot bed, so we've had to condense space a little bit from what we had on our old rig. Um, it's a nice slide out they uh, gave us. So starting up top, uh, obviously we've got uh, flashlights mounted. Um, we've got a uh, extinguisher over here, a dry cam extinguisher that we keep in case we come across a car fire or something like that. And then on the far side, we have bolt cutters uh, mounted. We've used those in several occasions where we're trying to access some of the um, trails where people ride bikes, et cetera, and we can't get a frontline engine or an ambulance in there. They'll send my rig because I have access and we can cut locks or a, a fence something, uh, for access reasons. Um, hydration, obviously, as we know, is, is a big thing for firefighters. Um, we really push hydration here when we go on fire incidents or summertime when we have long drawn out incidents in periods of hot weather. Um, having hydration for all the firefighters is, is imperative. So all battalion chief rigs, all safety rigs uh, carry a cooler. Currently we're moving to electric coolers, um, which enables us to have uh, cold water at all times for our folks. Um, this is an old school Yeti where we still have to change out the ice packs. Um, they're going to change to electric cooler for all, all the uh, rigs moving forward. Uh, we carry wildland gear here. Uh, in Battalion 1, we have a lot of urban interface areas. Um, so we have the Battalion Chief uh, web gear uh, helmet, a wildland helmet, wildland web gear um, in the orange bag. And then we have three sets of uh, spare wildland gear uh, to give if there's um, um, crews that need uh, extra gear. They're running heavy on a rig and don't have enough on their rig. So we keep spare gear. What you won't see right now is uh, extra tactical gear. We usually carry extra tactical gear, which is, which is the ballistic vest and helmet, like I showed you earlier. Um, because we're riding four and five people right now on most of our frontline rigs, all of our extras are lent out to a frontline rig. So we'll get those back and eventually be carrying those also. Uh, here, obviously, I need an SCBA. This is my SCBA here. We keep it in a mounted bracket that's locked up to prevent it from coming out when we're driving around. Um, we have one spare air cylinder that we get also and then uh, our new thermal imager cameras, which I'm sure you've all seen. So um, keep one of those also. Some people might be wondering why a battalion chief would need an air pack when you sit inside the truck. Yeah, so anytime we go on a confirmed incident, a confirmed structure fire, we send two battalion chiefs at minimum. Uh, oftentimes the district chief will also add themselves to the call. Um, when we get on scene there, the first due, uh, first due battalion chief will be in command and will stay in their truck. Oftentimes, the second battalion chief will be given a division role, and that requires them to go inside structures. So obviously, we want to wear the full PPE, just like every other firefighter, including our SCBA. I just keep a personal bag. Oftentimes, uh, we come to work, we don't know what we're going to be faced with. Um, in the summertime, we go on uh, wildland fires, and we could end up in Boulder County. We could end up down in Colorado Springs. We never know where we're going to end up. Um, we need to be self-sufficient for up to 24 hours. So I carry a little bag here that has extra socks, an extra t-shirt, that sort of thing, protein bars, um, just in case I get sent out of district. Hand tools, we keep a uh, Halligan for sure. Uh, it's important for us if we are given a divisional role and we're going into a fire structure um, to have a way in and a way out. And obviously everyone should have a hand tool, including battalion chiefs, we keep a Halligan here. This is a uh, combi tool. This is used on wildland incidents. Um, so if you're given a divisional role in a wildland incident, same thing. You wanna have a hand tool in case you come across any sort of fire um, so you can scrape uh, fire, help put it, extinguish any fire you come across. Um, and then this is just a box we keep with um, tire chains, some ice melt, um, a portable uh, charger for the battery, a tow strap, and then different scene tapes that we keep. In the back, we also have a, uh, a water can, a uh, water extinguisher that we'll keep here, pressurized water extinguisher. Um, same thing in case we come across a fire, 
That way we have a means to put any sort of fire out. All right, moving over to the passenger side of the vehicle, come to the radio compartment. Um, like I said, this used to be on the driver's side with these new rigs, uh, the three new battalion chief rigs, they're gonna be on this side. Um, so in addition to the radios, we have a couple other things. Uh, we have our Q-Ray, our gas monitor that we keep here. Um, we do a morning check on that each morning that we come in, make sure that it's operating correctly. Um, you may notice it says engine 17. That doesn't really mean anything anymore. Uh, it used to be a dedicated Q-Ray that was on engine 17, but anymore we have so many of these that it's uh, whatever one is available and in service they'll put on my rig. Um, if anyone in my battalion would have one of theirs go out of service, I act as the spare. I will give it to the frontline rig. For example, Tower 18, if they would lose theirs, I would give them a Q-Ray and I'd run with that one. Statistically, I don't need it uh, as much as the rigs do. Uh, we have an extra flashlight in here. Uh, we keep a radio harness. Um, and then we have different uh, radios. You'll notice one is a yellow radio, one of the black radio. Just like when we were inside the cab, the 800s versus the VHF. The black radios are the VHF that we'll use on primarily wildland incidents or incidents where our 800 com uh, comms aren't working real well. We'll use the VHF. So I've got two portables here with a couple spare batteries. Um, and then the yellow or lime green radios are our 800s. So I've got a couple spare radios. I've got one lint out right now to another station. And then we keep spare batteries, obviously, also for the uh, 800s. Um, our masks, um, our masks have Bluetooth in them now. Uh, it's a great upgrade and, and has really improved our communications overall. Uh, those require batteries, so we keep a, a charger and two spare batteries for our masks in the battalion rig also. And then of course our thermal imaging camera um, is a battery operated also, so we have two spare uh, tick batteries and a charger there. All right, Chief, thanks for letting me hang out with you today and take a look at the brand new Battalion Chief One rig. Um, I think it's probably eye-opening for a lot of people to see. There's a really funny stand-up comedian video about the fire SUV, and it's just the person that says, hey, put water there, put water there. But there's a lot more to the job, I think. I appreciate it, Eric. Thanks for coming out today and taking a look at the uh, new BC One rig. And thank you, YouTube. We'll see you in the next video.